Fiona, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today on this webinar on the, the super grid and what it can offer Ireland and Europe. Um, first of all, I, I'd just like to thank uh, the working group, everyone involved in the working group and everyone in Win Energy Ireland for helping get the position paper to where it is today um, and for organising this event and uh, organising some brilliant speakers. And I look forward to the discussion afterwards. So as Una mentioned, I'm chair of the Supergrid Working Group and we're relatively young. We're about a year now in existence through Win Energy Ireland. And this has been our core focus for that year in developing a position paper and establishing why a supergrid is so important to Europe and what it can offer Ireland as well. So when we look at the future and more topical now than ever, uh, we need to look at what's going to occur to our energy system. We know that electrification is going to increase its share of energy, and as a result, there's going to be an increase in electricity demand. The end result is that there's going to be a huge requirement for over 2,000 gigawatts of renewables uh, to decarbonize the European energy system. As has already been pointed out, we have rich renewable resources in Ireland, as well as other northern seas, such as the North Sea and Baltic Sea, uh, but we've also got a huge amount of solar resource in the south, and what we want to push forward is connecting these areas of rich resource uh, with demand centers predominantly in Central Europe. So what will occur is a supergrid will act like a motorway uh, in rapidly moving power from areas high of resource to the major demand centers. So if you can picture what it used to be like driving from Dublin to Cork uh, and what it's like now with a motorway, it makes a huge difference in how efficient we can move around. The same will occur with the grid. When we look at the actual potential in Ireland, we see that we have way more potential than what we could ever use. So for Ireland, the opportunity really is offering a route to market. We have neighboring countries that while having good renewable resource uh, is more optimal to actually take power from Ireland's system and move it into the demand centers. So we are neighboring the likes of the UK and France, but even pushing power beyond these countries and entities. So the advantages that a supergrid really offers is being able to tackle decarbonization on a continental scale. It, climate change is not a, a challenge that is faced independently. We need to unite as a, as a continent and as a union and, and tackle climate change together, as this will result one in the most effective response to climate change, but also from our energy system offer the most efficient manner of uh, tackling climate change. When we consider what's ongoing now with gas and oil, what it offers Europe is the opportunity to become energy independent. So we will no longer depend on other entities and other countries for our energy. And as we continue decarbonizing, electricity in particular is becoming more and more important. Europe as a whole needs to become independent of fossil fuels. It will allow for a more stable energy system and reduce the volatility as we're seeing at the minute with electricity prices. A supergrid will also allow Europe to achieve decarbonisation and its targets. So without our, a supergrid, there is likely to be a national response and what will occur is a, a less effective and less efficient system where more renewables will end up being built and questions on whether these can actually be met on time it will be posed. So what a supergrid will allow for is again locating the renewables where the resource is strongest and facilitating a more cost effective response. When we look at the geographic spread of renewables, as I've already mentioned, we have the strong wind in the north and the solar in the south. There is a seasonal complementary relationship whereby the high pressures in summer result in wind dropping slightly, but of course solar resource increases. And the opposite is true in the winter where wind speeds increase and solar declines. So the opportunity in connecting the solar resource in the south and the wind resource in the north allows for a more stable uh, grid with the renewables interconnected. This will result all in all in a grid that will have less constraints compared to today with respect to dispatch down and um, curtailment, as well as reducing other issues um, with uh, increasing the level of renewables on our national grid systems today. It will result in a more stable, secure electri electricity system, again, taking advantage of the, the geographic spread of renewables. And finally, in terms of Europe and Europe Inc, what it'll offer is the opportunity to become a world leader in grid technology and innovation. It, the super grid will not be an easy task. It will be a huge infrastructure project, but what will result is a new industry growing in Europe that we can then share knowledge and experience as well as supply chain with the rest of the world um, and developing grid infrastructure outside of Europe as well. 
So when we look at what's happening today in coordination, we've heard mention already of uh, TENI, which I'll touch on a bit later on, but there has been lots of discussion more recently on the development of an independent system operator. So an entity that will be responsible with uh, the plan development of scenarios, performing cost benefit analysis for the infrastructure itself and looking at what technology is needed and what gaps exist and how this all ties together into a more coherent plan for the development of a grid. The idea of a super grid is not a new one. It's been around for some time now. And as a result, there's been a huge amount of work done in the space, looking at the opportunities and benefits of uh, moving towards a more co coordinated approach to grid development. The images shown here on the right are taken from a study by E3G and Imperial College released just over a year ago in the UK, showing the differences uh, between two scenarios uh, for the development of grid and integration of renewables in the North Seas. And what you can see highlighted most importantly is that moving towards a coordinated approach uh, nearly halves the actual cost of the, the network development. And really the key benefits beyond the cost are from the environment, environmental perspective, whereby potential delays due to individual grid projects being uh, um, held up is reduced. And as a result, there is actually less duplication on the quantity of electrical cables needed, as well as offshore infrastructure. I'd like to also point out that Ireland has the presidency this year for the North Sea's Energy Cooperation, which is a, a cross-border group cons consisting of nine European states and the European Commission. And what this offers Ireland now is the opportunity to lead discussion and lead Ireland's um, priorities with respect to taking full advantage of our offshore wind resource. The current work programme is looking at a more coordinated planning for offshore grid projects in order to meet and facilitate the increased uh, deployment of offshore wind. So really, this year's plan is very tied in with the topic of a super grid and the infrastructure needed. And we'd really like to, to Ireland to push forward and develop this market for, for uh, Ireland to facilitate our climate change targets, as well as uh, developing a supply chain and industry uh, that will allow us to tap into our resource. Some other more prominent projects as well uh, include the promotion project, which was a European funded project looking at multi-terminal and meshed offshore HVDC grids. And one of the key outputs and conclusions from this, this incredible piece of work uh, undertaken was that the meshing of the grid where appropriate generally leads to lower curtailment and higher security of supply. So a mesh grid between multiple countries, as well as coordinating the approach, really does offer an opportunity to develop a stronger, more resilient grid, uh, which is vital as we progress towards decarbonisation. With respect to the 10E, the Trans-European Networks for Energy, uh, as uh, has already been mentioned and discussed, it underwent a revision um, with respect to uh, it, its, its um, what it outlined as a policy. So one of the key outputs and identified areas really is in developing a regional approach to offshore grids proposed, as this is a concept that would be vital. So for Ireland, it would include working together with our neighbours in the UK and France in looking at how we develop our offshore resource in the Celtic Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. So what's commented uh, from ENSOE, the European National Transmission System Operators for Electricity, uh, the key quote mentioned that developing and publishing integrating offshore network development plans is, is crucial towards achieving 2050 targets. And what's a vital really as part of this is looking at the intermediate steps. So when we look at our targets for renewables, 2030 is seen as a, a milestone and it really is, but we need to start considering how the grid develops with the future beyond that taken into consideration. Finally, on one example as a case study, another project done for the Baltic Sea, and I feel it's quite relevant for Ireland because it looked at an area uh, that perhaps doesn't get the attention that the North Sea gets with respect to offshore wind. And what was considered was exploring the potential for meshing the offshore grids of uh, the countries with the coastline out onto the Baltic Sea. What was performed were two pre-feasibility studies looking at the meshed grid configuration compared to a business as usual radial approach, uh, which is what we see built today. And what the results found was that a meshed grid approach to grid development would be more cost efficient in essentially most cases, uh, as well as other huge advantages beyond cost, uh, in particular environmental. Uh, as has already been mentioned, fewer cables required, fewer landfall points required, as well as facilitating more easy uh, transmission of power between the countries uh, around the Baltic Sea. 
So with a project of the scale, there are of course barriers and risks involved. It is not easy to take on a project of this scale and unite so many countries, but things are changing. So the political opposition or lack of political determination could pose a concern and a delay to policies that would facilitate and support the development of a project. What we're seeing now is a unification in view towards energy independence, and we've seen huge progress and acceptance that meshed grids, in particular in the offshore, will be vital for achieving our 2050 targets. When we consider again the collaboration and coordination between governments and stakeholders, there is a huge amount of entities that will be involved. And as a result, coordinating the approach and ensuring that all stakeholders are happy with how things progress is vital. So this is everything from the industry itself and government bodies, as well as stakeholders and other users of the sea and coastal areas. When we consider technology, there is of course huge developments ongoing on the generation side, but sometimes not considered is innovation and development of new technologies in grid. And what we'd like to see is further um, incentivization from the government and from the commission promoting more innovation and in grid technologies. A lagging of innovation in these areas could result in a less optimal technology being utilized, which could result in delays as well as a less effective system as a whole. And finally, there will be a requirement for significant upgrades beyond the supergrid. Regardless of a supergrid, onshore networks within each country's boundaries need to be reinforced to facilitate the movement of power. We are moving beyond the ease of putting a coal or gas plant where it's needed. We want to put renewables where the resource is best, and as a result, the corridors for power to flow need to be developed within the national grid, as well as allowing the connection of the supergrid into each national grid as well. So what a supergrid offers Ireland is the opportunity to take full advantage of our offshore wind resource. We have a relatively low demand in Ireland in and around six gigawatts at its peak, but our opportunity for offshore wind extends well beyond the six gigawatts. So we have a 2030 target of five gigawatts, but there's also a longer 2050 target of 30 gigawatts and potentially more of floating off the west coast of Ireland. In theory, we could actually extend it beyond this 30 gigawatts as well, but what we lack is a market for these renewables. There's already been mention of hydrogen, and of course a hydrogen strategy is vital for Ireland, but we've also got an opportunity to develop the electrical infrastructure that will connect us to neighbouring grids, which can take the power. So when we look at the UK and France, we have an opportunity to connect into a long-standing neighbour in the UK, as well as continental Europe, where the export of power can facilitate these 30 gigawatts. Even as electrification increases in Ireland, we won't have a market for that nationally. So the opportunity is to look beyond. So developing the grid for Ireland would allow us to become a net exporter of power, something that we haven't had ever. So no longer will we be, de be dependent on imported fossil fuels. We will have our own green energy to meet our needs, as well as the ability to export beyond it. This will help us achieve our decarbonisation targets of 2050, but also help neighbouring countries achieve the 2050 targets. Developing our offshore potential is vital in developing a supply chain for Ireland and developing an industry for renewables in Ireland beyond what is currently existing. It will strengthen it and offer us the opportunity to export this expertise and supply chain to other neighbouring markets as well. So our recommendations from the paper, our first key recommendation is with respect to maritime spatial planning. So in order to support an international cross-border meshed offshore grid, there needs to be strong cooperation and communication between the national maritime spatial planning authorities and energy authorities. Without this, we will end up and result with grid that is less optimal for its purpose. We also want to consider that there are many other stakeholders involved in the sea in particular. We want to consider that whatever is proposed and developed falls in line with what is acceptable to all other stakeholders. This is not only just for the energy industry, this is for Europe as a whole, and as such, all stakeholders deserve a strong say in it. And in particular, from an Irish perspective, the next revision of our maritime special plan really needs to consider future grid requirements beyond what's coming in particular in the next decade. There needs to be consideration for what might be coming and what needs to come beyond 2030. 
Our second recommendation is with respect to resources. There is a huge amount of potential for Ireland to develop a supply chain, but what's required is huge hiring as well from a government and regulator perspective. And we are pleased to see the likes of Airgrid hiring quite rapidly in the offshore environment here, but we think this needs to increase further. So of course, there's a huge uh, amount of momentum behind the 2030 target of five gigawatts, but there must not be uh, a forgetful forgetfulness of what occurs after 2030. So there's a need for entities now to start looking at what occurs beyond 2030 and have the discussions now uh, so that we do not get to 2030 and are stuck considering how we get to 2040 next. So if we want to have a say on how grid policy changes and how grid develops in Europe as a whole, we need to start building up our expertise and knowledge base in Ireland, both within industry itself, as well as within the government entities. So to do this, we are pushing for likes of government departments on board Planola, Airgrid, ESB and others to continue pushing forward with hiring the expertise needed for the offshore sector. With respect to grid planning, I've mentioned this already, and it's a key focus in the paper is that a huge amount of focus is there for 2030, and we're delighted to see that, but we cannot let 2050 be forgotten about. So discussions now need to be begin on grid planning. So we would like to propose that for Ireland to develop a longer term regional roadmap for how the grid might develop. And again, this is a, a possible study and piece of work that is done and performed with neighboring countries such as the UK and France. This will give all countries an aligned vision on how the grid will develop and in particular along the English Channel, the Celtic Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. Considering how long grid projects in particular take to, to get from planning stages to the actual operation of the project, we need bold policy making and reinforcing the, the actual cooperation between the countries uh, to facilitate this, this development. With respect to future grid implementation, uh, the recent Shaping Our Electricity Future Report from AirGrid indicates a, a continuance of the incremental approach to grid planning. And we understand that the focus is on 2030, but we need a more ambitious approach to post-2030. We would like to call for a coordination council to be established that will facilitate a more easy channel of communication on post 2030 topics for the grid between industry, air grid, ESB and other government entities. We believe that regular engagement in it through this council would facilitate um, a, a more rounded approach and more frequent conversation between industry and the TSO. And we feel this would really strengthen Ireland's position in its plan and approach to a post 2030 and decarbonized energy system. And finally, we've international relations. We have the opportunity that while Brexit has occurred to reinforce relations with the UK. Brexit or not, we are all in this fight against climate change together and we will not be capable of operating an efficient system in Ireland without cooperation from our neighbours. And likewise, the UK has as a resource that they would also like to work with Europe and, and get into the system. So we would like to push for deeper international relations, in particular through NSEC, um, where cooperation amongst the regions and entities would discuss grid development for post-2030 and how best to locate renewables. It's a topic that will be challenging. It's something that a lot of countries may not like uh, having their renewable sources coming from outside their borders, but it is something that for Europe as a whole will reinforce its unity as well as its energy independence in achieving decarbonisation. So finally, I have some slides here and I won't read them all out as we have a few, but I think there's some important ones here, identifying really uh, some key stakeholders in how important Ireland is potentially to development of the future uh, grid if we take the opportunity. So really the the uh, statement by Eamon Ryan was an important one where, quote, due to our location at the edge of the Atlantic with a sea area of 490,000 square kilometres, we have considerable but as yet undeveloped offshore renewable energy potential. As technologies develop, Ireland has the resource potential to become a major contributor in a pan-European renewable energy and transmission system. The German finance minister recently said that renewable energy is freedom, and really we are seeing that no more important now uh, than ever. 
the age of the supergrid has arrived and it will play a major role in decarbonizing the world and ultimately bring cheaper electricity to consumers as well as achieving our climate change ambitions.